outline is brief. Let me do it 10 minutes on each one of these topics. So what do we mean by complex? Uh, here we have complex system or network science. What does network science say about internet? What, do, what does our engineering view say about internet? And then finish up with one key message that is when we talk about networks like the internet which we designed, how relevant are random network models to describe that? And some implication. And I also want to you know, uh, certainly uh, acknowledge this is work that I have done over the last 10 years with many people from many companies. So it's a, it has been a collaborative effort. Many of the things that I'm talking about is joint work with people and with students. Also. So let me start by network science. So many of you, you know, probably have seen this uh, sort of uh, origin of this field as far as sort of when you try to point to literature. And that is a study that was done in uh, 2005, was published in 2006 by the National Research Council on network science. And that study sort of tries to attempt to describe what is this field, why is it important, what are the important questions. Here's just a very brief summary of you know, what, what is out there, uh, why do we do this, or why should we do this. There's not much to argue, it certainly makes sense. Uh, if you then go and ask, you know, what is network science, you can find sort of some working definition there in this report. And what you should remember from this definition is really sort of, you know, it aims to sort of say what we should study these networks for is in order to get predictive models so that we can understand this kind of thing. So the goal is to develop predictive models. Uh, why should we do this? Yeah, I mean, again, this sort of makes sense because if you have good predictive models and you now want to design a system that you're interested in, with that knowledge, you can do better. Or you can define, design a new system with this knowledge that does certain things in ways that the old system has been able to do. And then, you know, who is doing this work? Turns out that, for example, this report was put together by a committee that mostly consisted of physicists. I mean, not, I mean, not experimental physicists, I mean statistical physicists. And there was, I know of one network person who was on this one out of a dozen. So, it's, it's very clearly dominated by physics perspective of that. What does it talk about, what does the report talk about in terms of what are potentially interesting questions? And again, you look at these questions and you say, yeah, this, this is a reasonable question that makes sense to ask and to study. Uh, again, one of the criticism here may be that this emphasis on network structure very quickly removes things like that there exists protocol that go with the structure. Then they come in here. It's not quite clear if you, if you formulate this question this way that you capture that aspect. This is a, a sort of I like because it, you know, I, I never know I never know when somebody asks this question. So to what extent is self-organization responsible for convergence of systems? So these are two buzzwords that everybody uses, but what is the precise meaning of this? So <coughs> but the first question is certainly there. And again, it reflects the physics perspective. If you have all these networks out there, you know, a reasonable question is to ask, do they have something in common? Whether it's a biological network or a communication network or something. And then another question that comes up very quickly is, you know, how do we understand the vulnerability for the systems? So my point here is that these are certainly you know, a subset of the right questions that you should ask. They make sense, it would be nice to be able study those things in the, in the context of systems that we are interested in. The question that sits now there is, is network science in its current form the right approach? Does it provide the sort of answers we And the litmus test that I'm using for answering this question is, let's look specifically about what network science has to say about it, because we know think we know about it. The 
provider, that's sort of a yeah, quick uh, again pointing out why should we care about this in general? So why should we care that there is something not called network science out there that's going to be the buzzword and the hot topic in a number of areas? So as a scientific discipline, uh, so I was too lazy to continue this blog, but it's, it's an example of if you just count the number of publications, exponential growth. And, and you see that the, the physicists really get a chunk of it. So. Another argument from a scientific perspective is that you know, we are always interested in citation counts. So you know, in our area, if we have citation counts of a couple of hundreds, we sort of get all excited. This is 2007. If you do the same citation count today, you probably get tens of for the top of it. But these are numbers that we will never, <laughs> well, most of us will never, <laughs> will never achieve. And it's just an indication of, you know, there are some papers in this new hot topic that are cited and not. And you would expect that with your citations of that number, that these papers are solid. Why would you expect that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 naive, the naive thinking here is that if science and nature are the flagship journals of scientific enterprise in the world, what gets in there should be should have been checked by experts to a degree that removes obvious mistakes. No, that is the naive belief. You know, I understand it was the director of the Alexandria Library when he had to decide how to convert some of the medical documents from papyri to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, animal skin. Uh -huh. And he said that if he had decided on the basis of popularity of, of uh, references, a lot of important significant scientific discoveries by the ancient would have never been populated. They would never be propagated in the next generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so, I said that I agree with you. Just to remind ourselves that this is their century. So there's a scientific uh, yeah. literature, there is network science for the masses. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> Very quickly, in the last year, since the early 2000s, sequence of books come around that are ready to see reviews in the New York Times magazine. Even worse, when well, even worse, even more. If you look over the last five, six years, each year there is at least one book that claims to tell you everything about the internet from this book. And you know, you can sort of say, oh, you are just gems. Because we, we never write that many books. We never write any book. Well, some of us some people, we write books, but <laughs> it takes us a long time. These books come out within one year. Now, you know, a little closer to home, this topic area has also started to infiltrate the curriculum. Graduate and undergraduate. And I just <coughs> looked, you're looking around a little bit I mean, in a couple of different places. So, you know, Georgia Tech offers a course in network science, in the computer science. Uh, and of course, the US military is pretty big about this. Uh, the Greek guys were early <laughs> with, with offering courses. You have uh, Michigan has, has courses. Uh, Texas State has courses, of course. So, you know, in places where some of these representatives of this new network science are, you will find these courses, and many of them are offered in engineering, or joint use engineering. The question, you know, you look at this and say, so what, what do they actually teach them? And, you know, so sometimes it's, it's interesting to see actually what they work for you, and then you start to worry about it. And then, of course, you, know, you want to know how serious a science is in network science. As it is being currently advocated. And the main point of this talk is really to show you that if you do 
network science and look at its ability in the context of the internet. Here is the play. What, what's out there is, is, is you know, people like to say it's controversial. I am saying it's not controversial. It's just not right. Uh, and there are two pieces to what I'm going to do. Is one I, I hope to demonstrate to you with relative obvious arguments why, why this stuff that's out there as far as the internet is concerned, or why it's wrong. And then take a positive spin of it. Does it suggest ways that we haven't been thinking about before that actually gets us closer to where we want to be? So that's the second point. So, so at first you sort of <coughs> negative in terms of this, you deconstruct, and in the second part I will do it. So what does network science in its current form say about it? And it is, this is work that's almost now 10 years old. But it's still being taught. So the concrete problem we are looking at is internet routing, route level topology. As many pieces of work in network science, it's measurement driven. So somebody has data about these aspects of the internet. And people take the data, make inference, make models. That's the general process. As a textbook example for the power of network science, it has these three very, very consistent pieces. So it appears to be solid if you look at it first time. It's a feeling, very, very feeling. And that's one of the big dangers that's there. And then it looks like you did this in the internet, or the same thing actually can be done in all other domains that you're interested in. That, of course, should already raise a question. Internet is not like the technology network, it's not like the social network. But, but that's typically the, the thing. So, what does it say in particular? So, where, did, where do the data come from? You have the very well known trace scout tool that all of us can run, and we can collect data. It's just a question of to how many places in the internet can be trace scout tool. The more friends you have, the more you can do trace scout But this has been done. We know how it works. Uh, this is what you get, and basically what it tells you is that from, you know, from ATT Labs research in New Jersey to, let's say, Duke, you go through roughly 15 numbers. And the picture makes sense, because that's what this all tells you, which way it goes from New Jersey to Duke. And so if you had more people, then you get all this stuff, and so this has been work that has been going on now since the uh, you know, late 90s, and still going on large scale trace on stars. Uh, there is Ramesh uh, Govindan, Skidda. We have uh, Mr. Rocket Fuel, there's there's Neil. <laughs> Neil is here. No, Neil is not here. No, no he, Neil is the corner. <laughs> so yeah, Neil was, was one of the main drivers of rocket fuel. The lines is going on, and there are some other projects that do this. And, and it's, it's all based on, on, on and so you get these pictures that everybody has seen one with the other. Uh, this is, you know, it's always sort of sold as this is the internet. I always have to say that this is not the internet, but anyway, this is nice pictures. These are other pictures that they may, may, may make a little bit more sense. These are, this is one rocket fuel result of one topology, this is another topology of two different networks. And so you have all this data, now you do the internet. And of course, the question is when we saw the first plot, it's <coughs> this large trace route data, it's a big mess to display. So you need some, some summary and statistic of the activity structure that you try to study. And somehow people latch on this one statistic and that is no degree distribution. So you look at these graphs, and you count the nodes that have degree one, degree two, degree three, and it gives you the and the sort of surprising thing is that if you do it, uh, what you get is something that looks like, or has been sold as power law. Physicists, of course, love power laws because that uh, lets them in to do stuff that you could do if you don't have a power law. And sort of the practical aspect of power law is basically saying that there are an instantiation of the fact that a few of the nodes have enormous large degrees, and most of the nodes have very small degrees. That's sort of the way you say. And this is then the famous Paluzzo's work on the, the 
1999 sitcom paper that says internet topology is power. And so what you what you have here is two instances of topologies. You have you have these base nodes, you have the connectivity structure, you look at the graphs, you count the nodes that have degree one, two, three, and so on, and you rank them. So node one has the highest degree, node whatever ten thousand has the lowest degree, and you plot the rank versus the degree on a log log scale, and it looks like a log log scale. Line. And those are the basis of the claims that internet topology, in the sense of two instances, one router level topology, second one AS level topology. Those two topologies, according to Paluxos and Nathan, are exhibit power. And that then started the whole avalanche. The avalanche consists of So once you see this finding that no degrees have power loss, these traditional random graphs, they don't capture those phenomena, you need new models. And of course, <coughs> the most well-known class of models that came out is this scale-free models of the differential attachment problem, as it most people here are familiar with it. You can lower a graph by adding new nodes, and then you have to decide how the new node connects to the existing graph, and they do it in a preferential way. They connect with higher probability to highly connected nodes. So note that this graph construction is, the construction is random. So the way you put in a link is decided by a coin toss. That's the random That's the random model. And then it's shown that this kind of models produce power laws, and uh, you know, we have many, many versions of those. But the, the basic one is really sort of telling the whole story, and they have been then referred to as the scale free graphs, the scale free networks. So, <coughs> key features to remind yourself is that you know, the randomness comes in through coin tossing, the bias coins, in terms of do I connect this node? And the result is you have now a model that has power on node fields. Okay, great, that's exactly what we want because the internet has power. This is a you know, generic picture that you can graph that you can construct according to that generative model and that's what it looks like. And then, so model validation is done by saying, well, uh, you know, this is precisely what we were going after. We, we wanted a graph that has power on node degrees. We have it now, so this must be a good one. And so now we have achieved the purpose of network science. We have a predictive model. And now the question is, what does it tell us? <coughs> there are four big, big conclusions that are implications of this model. First one is the high degree nodes there must be high degree nodes because we have the power. The high, these high degree nodes are sitting in the core of the network. And the few high degree nodes that exist because of the power law, they, they basically form a hub in the core. If you now think about fragility of the network, that tells you very quickly what you should do if you want to destroy this network. Kill those nodes. This was then referred to the Achilles heel of the internet. Physicists discovered a feature of the internet that apparently the engineers have never been able to realize that you just have to, you can bring down the internet by, by attacking these high degree nodes in the core of the network. That's the main message of this paper. If you're interested in, in this type of networks in terms of how does the network, the, uh, what's the, the, the spread of with any disease for the network, it has the possibly worst scenario. And again, it's clear that once the, once the disease hits a high degree nodes, a node, then it's your death. Everybody gets it. So, in terms of predictive power and implication, this is an odd, very simple, very appealing, scale free model. You didn't need to know anything about the network, the internet, you just the measure 
gives you a model that has all these implications. But that's quite serious. And then, so th th this is next. What you think nature is one of the flagship journals of science, right? It's, it's a <coughs> now, as I said, another appeal of this whole approach is I didn't need to use any specifics of the internet to get to this point. So why not apply the same thinking to biology, to whatever? And this is exactly what happened. So you have, uh, just take for example, technological networks, the US power grid. There's data out there that you can get from the web. And you can construct a graph that Apparently, it represents the US power. There it is. Uh, it looks a little messy, but you know, again, as a graph structure, you can do it. You know, the result is always has power. Uh, you know, some of you may remember the story on that power grid uh, literature. So, there was a paper in 2009 by two Chinese uh, researchers that sort of created quite a little bit of a story in the US because uh, in some hearing in Congress, one of the people mentioned the fact that, oh, there's this paper out there uh, that claims to be able to destroy the US power. Whereas this, so this has been applied to individual networks this is one of our recent papers, again, it's like my nature, that tackles the right, the right problem, but again, in a way that may be quite not the way that you do it. And that is, internet and power grid, there are two critical infrastructures that depend on one uh, What can we say about the dependence? Again, if you think, if you, if you have a model where each one of these pieces are described by a scale free model that has this Achilles heel as a hit, you basically know what you do. And you know bad things can happen. And uh, even at the end of the day, you realize that none of these models describe each one of these pieces correctly. You end up with something potential for it. Yeah. Okay, so the impact of what network science has been doing is, you know, in general, it has been a, it has been a huge success story. And if you look at the publication literature, if you look at its impact on the scientific community, on the public, uh, you can look at it from a serious side. You can also look at it from a more humorous side. So a year ago, there was a cartoon in the New York Times. So, you know, so, said. so network science tells you, it gives you a recipe of how you attack your enemy without nuclear weapons. If you want to bring down the internet, you attack the high degree nodes. If you want to bring down the uh, you know, banking system of the, of the US, you attack the few banks that are the biggest. Uh, so it's, it's, or if you want to bring down the country by destroying the grid, you know exactly what. Same story over and over. So, so this is more humorous way of saying you know, it has an impact. Yes, but even, uh, now, what about the networking people? So, uh, either they couldn't care less, or they say it's kind of cool. The question is now, <coughs> what we're talking. So now, I'm going to tell you what we're talking. By the way, so we have a very, very similar story. It's repeating itself in biology. This is so. If you think, get it wrong in the internet, okay, who cares really? If you really get the story wrong in biology, people can die. So you have to be a little bit careful. <coughs> so if you want to go back to the basics, we also have to ask a very basic question. That is, so all this started with measurements. Based on. And you have to ask the question, so 
do these measurements and they're going to support sort of claims that have been made. And uh, you know, when you ask this question, you come across sort of three pieces. That is, what's the quality of the data? What's the statistics of the data? And how has model validation been implemented? So, you know, you have data that are of some, somebody gave it to you. Are you spending time checking how good the data is? Once you know how good the data is, you know actually what statistic you can do with the data. Then you end up with a model, and then there is always the question of, you know, Armand gives me a model, John gives me a model, how do I decide which one is more consistent with the other, which one is better? So what's the one model validation that's been done? So these are the three pieces that I think we always should sort of keep in mind in this context of measurement in research. You have the data, you have the inference, you have the models. Make sure that you work with good data is step number one. And of course, this is a tedious job. People don't really like it too much, but you know, the one uh, aspect that we have to remember in, in the context of the internet is that it's easy to measure traffic. If I have the right piece of hardware that I can put on the link, it's easy to pick off every packet of a map. Collecting internet-wide measurements about connectivity is very, very hard because nobody has access to network-wide connectivity. As a network service provider, from a AT&T perspective, I know I can go and find the people who know about the physical connectivity of the routers of at and But I don't know about the Ryzen routers. Nobody knows them except the right. And yet we are trying to map this output level topology of property, irrespective of what we are. And this is hard. And so one message to keep in mind is, you know, what we want to measure is the physical link. We have a method called trace route that we use to do that. Does trace route give you what you want? It turns out that trace route doesn't give you what you want. It gives you something else. So this is really what I had before. Naively speaking, you have to you know, give you all the, all the routers that you have to encounter from going from B to B. And, you know, and the little detail that sort of gets <coughs> lost in all these trace out based studies in general, or particularly on the physics side, is yeah, trace out turns out to be a hack. It was never designed to map the physical structure of the network. It was mapped, it was designed by Ben Jacobson for one particular purpose, just to check how do you go from it. And one of the key problems has been the fact that so it doesn't give you the router, it gives you an interface, a key address of the router. And that the router can have many such addresses. And we have, in general, no way for certainty to map the IP address, interface IP addresses onto a router. It has been gotten lost. Neil, in the rocket fuel work, they spend most of the time trying to fix that problem. But it's all heuristics. So this is the problem. Uh, this is the real stuff. You have these two interfaces of one and the same router. Trace out coming from two different ways, maybe to this picture. And if you have no idea that these two elements are, can be mapped to this one router, then you work with this graph and not with that. How bad can it get? Well, so thanks to uh, Adam, which was, who was published, he, you know, he, he was working on this uh, college map issue and gave us a solution for it as well. And so there was, there has always been this one network out there that everybody has access to, and heavily, which is now called the Internet too. 12 nodes. We know everything about this network. If you do trace route, so they did trace route, this uh, rocket fuel, and uh, this is the picture that you get. Uh, 
Where is this picture? So if you study about the level topology where this is the graph versus about the topology where this is the graph, it's a two very different things. <coughs> and this is the, the simple thing is the fact that in this context, <coughs> if, if you don't know how to map the interface addresses between the routers, this is what you're going to do. And as I said, you know. People have made, over the last five, six years, improvements in this domain. So today we have relative good heuristic to actually fix this problem, but it's certainly not, it's not a complete solution. But even if you had a solution to this, you, know, you still have problems. And that is, you have this issue. So many of the networks today, the traditional service providers, use layer two technology to ship their traffic. Their own network. And what that basically means is a packet that I send into this network, into that particular, let's say, a one sends a network into ADT's network. It comes to AT&T and, and the ingress site on the IP router, and I see it. Then it disappears from the IP level and only comes back out of the ingress site. So if you have an hour network that has a thousand routers, it looks like a complete mesh. So this is this is the problem. <coughs> this is the visible infrastructure, and you ship now a packet comes in here and has to go anywhere. It, it looks like it goes directly to. And one of the pocket full data, it, even in 2000, whenever that was, 2002, layer three was a network that was known to use the technology. And here you see the picture. And of course, you know, these these come out as very high degree nodes. You just need enough no, enough uh, outers in that network, and you can get a graph that I believe not easily. So there's really a big irony in using trace out as it was done for mapping, for doing mapping of outer That is, you know, if there are high degree nodes, uh, that, so let me first the first one. So the high degree nodes in the middle of the network that trace out sees are not real because they are either artifacts of layer two or of AP, IP aliases two. If there are high degree nodes in the network, then we know that technology requires them to be at the edge of the network. Because only at the edge of the network do we have technology where we can multiplex lots of small links. But no trace or study will ever detect those high degree nodes at the edge because you will never have enough sources to trace out two in that in that domain. So we will never get it. So yeah, it, it's it's really ironic. Uh, uh, another irony is of course there has been lots of work on studying the theoretically the trace out behavior that uh, is uh, influencing the influence of, of graph structures. But they all have concentrated on the bias that trace out generates. So if there is a bias in the sense that trace out detects the structure close to the source better than far away. But you know, we are here working in a world <coughs> where you have systematic errors that you need to solve first. I don't care, in the presence of systematic errors, I don't care about bias. I want to first get rid of my system. So it's, again, so irony is there is lots of literature trace out out there, but it tackles the wrong problem. Okay, so trace out <coughs> the way to trace it probably should be trace out will always be a key element of any mapping method, but by itself it's useless. Lesson that we learned here is so, you know, somebody gives you a data set, always ask the question, how good is it? So, yeah. NSF is big on this big data stuff. So, petabyte data is a the proposal has to have the notion of petabyte data somewhere sitting in there because it's sensitive. But, you know, if 
you have better type of cow, which you still have cow. And, and this space of stuff for the magic purpose is an example. And again, as I said, doing this dirty work is, you, you don't get it into science or nature. That's the problem. So people don't intend to do it. But somebody has to do it. And uh, the lesson here is if we, if we are not careful as networking people, can we ask the physicists to be careful with the data? But we better be careful first. Make sure that the data that we ship outside and make available to the public is high quality. This has been an example of, you know, it's not an example because the data has been made public and available not for the purpose of that. It just been traced out so that here it will be made public available. It's just that it has been used for a purpose for which it was never designed. <coughs> Quickly, model uh, validation. So the criticism here has been, of course, as I said, I asked two people to come up with a model that has the feature that it matches a particular statistic. You have to expect that the two people come up with different models. How do you say which one is better? So, model validation should be more than data field. Now, what else can we do in this? So that brings in very quickly this notion that if you work in a particular context, the node and the links of the graph that you're working with has a meaning. It's not abstract. Uh, these are not abstract things. So in the outer level topology, the meaning of a node is this. It's an outer. So yeah, this is old technology, 2000, early 2000, but the basics is still true. Tells you that the top, so the top of the line, the outer you took in the early 2000, you could have 16 interface cards. That's all. If you used it, well, so if you use it at its most efficient, in its most efficient place. So that, that's this point up there. 16 would be the connectivity of a backbone of the network. You couldn't have more. How do you get to like maybe connectivity of 100? So we're still not talking about thousands. Well, you generalize this interface. But if you do that, then you have to pay a price. And the question is, so if you pay them, if you pay money for the most expensive output that's out there, and then use it in a very inefficient way, you have, to have a, you have to make an argument for that. But even if you do it in a very inefficient way, you, you only get to about 100. So with, in early 2000, with the top of the line autos that you could buy, you could potentially get noting rates of about, of about 100. So here's a validation that sort of say, how, how can you get to 1,000? Can you? Technology says impossible. But of course, what we look at nodes, because we are talking about graphs. Nodes are generic, things are generic. Uh, anybody ever looked at the network? So again, never insisted. And you could just simply check. You have these 12 routers or whatever. What's their connectivity? Well, look at the picture. I mean, do you see high three nodes? No. If you don't care. So mean into this network, do you see how you do know it there? No, because it's a similar structure, backbone and axis. Well, is this a question of talking about networking today versus networking 20, 30 years ago? No, because even in the early stages of the internet, you didn't see any grid. So you know, this is an argument where I say anybody who looks at the physical plane of a network knows that these nodes represent counters. Counters have technology constraints. They prevent high degree nodes immediately. OK, so our boy 
original question, a basic question to try to answer this is, do the state support the claims? Absolutely not. Because the quality is insufficient to be used for this purpose. And then of course, you see that now the level of knowledge is nothing like the professional So they can argue that certainly not so. Here's this beautiful science. Escape from networks, great very appealing. And then we come with this very you know, uh, ugly engineering detail that messes up everything that says because of technology reasons you cannot have it. Uh, too bad. <laughs> so what went wrong with the three pieces? One is you didn't assess the data right. You ignore all network infrastructure. Details. So as I said, this scale-free network construction as applied to internet router level topology didn't require you to know anything about it. It is just you draw a graph by bringing in new nodes and connecting it by by tossing cons. <coughs> and then the model validation, very, very naive in the sense that, oh, this must be a good model because it reproduces one statistic. That doesn't mean it's a good model. It just says you succeeded in coming up with a statistic model that captures one statistic. <coughs> and that means basically so you have to keep in mind three things. One is data, one is model validation, and then don't forget about your domain knowledge. When you studied networking, as a networking student, scale-free network construction should raise immediate questions uh, and you should, each time you see it used in a network context, you should ask the question, is this relevant or useful? So, if you come to this problem now from an engineering perspective, we, we approach it very differently. We are trying to design a network. Surely, what we don't want to do is cost coins to decide where the links go. We design a network for a purpose. The APD has a network. That network is not there for the fun of it, but it does certain things. What does it do? Well, roughly, I mean, uh, it's certainly my information on the whole model, but I think it can be abstracted to a very easy argument that says <coughs> this topology has to support some traffic demand. Yeah. Is the traffic demand now random? Very good. I come back immediately to that question. Yes. So, randomness is now not coming in by tossing coins that decides where I connect and out of. The randomness that I bring in is I don't know anything about the traffic demand. That's where the randomness comes. That's the uncertainty. How I connect you out of I, as an engineer, I, I know exactly how I do it. I know exactly which how I have to connect. That's not the question. So that's not the, the source of randomness. The source of randomness is this, the traffic. So now, you know, ISP wants to build a network in such a way that it, first of all, it can buy the equipment on the existing market. That means it has to use the technology that's out there. And then it wants to build it in such a way that it's efficient economically. It doesn't want to build a gold-plated network because that's too expensive. And then you also want to be somewhat robust to this uncertainty. So I don't know the traffic demand. It is fluctuating. I want to design a network in such a way that it can be robust to certain types of fluctuations of the traffic. That's my goal. So, boils down to a OR problem. Design something, we have an objective, you have constraints, and you want to be robust to some uncertainty. So, instead of graph theory, we have constraint optimization. And in this whole process, how long? Who cares? <coughs> So if you do this quickly, you have a sort of a three-step approach. One is, so, 
constraints. So any piece of hardware that you have to put in the network has to satisfy this constraint. So simplification here is all the routers are the same, which is not true. So we have multiple such constraints. Second one, we have to pick a predicate. This was hard a couple of years ago. Today, we on a routine basis, we compute the traffic matrix, we know it, we understand it relatively well, so we know more about this. And then the last step is you come up with the objective function. And again, each one of these three pieces can be expected. This is, this is a very simplistic way of thinking about the constraints. Uncertainty, objective. Whether the objective is really to ship as much traffic through the network as, as possible, that's up to you. You can pick a different objective. I don't care. But it brings together technology, uncertainty, and economics. So, and power also out of the picture. And then you do that, there is a very easy and very heuristic way of doing it, and that's exactly matching what we need to do in real networks. That is, if you do it this way, then you immediately end up with a core where you have the expensive routers that ship that have the highest capacity. And then these routers are fed from the edge by the other technology that's cheaper and lets you multiply more telegrams. I mean that's just simple network design number one or one on one and use of such technology that's and if you do it, then you, you get something like on the left-hand side, and you know, compare that to the right-hand side, you see stay in line. Then, by the way, these two graphs have identical, no bigger distribution. And if you think about it from a random perspective, so this is a typical graph. This is a graph that, you know, probability zero. And you can just uh, compare pretty much every item okay, for these differential attachment models. You look at it, what the heuristic optimization problem gives you, and it's, in each case, it's just the opposite. And this is sort of really a very telling example of if you approach the, this same problem from two different angles, you get two completely opposite results. The only common feature that they have is they happen to match the motivated distribution exactly. So that tells you about how important the motivated is. And we, <laughs> not okay, so I think up here. Know your data and keep on repeating that message. I know the preferential attachment and scale ones, they have enormous appeal. I don't need to know anything about the domain in order to say, oh, this graph is described by the scale graph. That makes it so appealing. But don't be you're fooled by this uh, by field because, in general, it's not very useful. It gives you actually the wrong way of looking at things. And then, from, again, from an engineering perspective, from a student perspective, Take all these courses that give you all this information about all the details in the network context. You learn about the protocols, you learn about feedback, and all this stuff. Architecture. These things have to be reflected in your model somehow, because if they aren't reflected, then you don't deal with the system that you actually use. Right, this is just <coughs> a, a, pointing out the fact that network vulnerability is just much more complex than knocking out nodes. Knocking out nodes is probably the least, uh, the least uh, effective way of destroying a network. Uh, if you want to destroy a network, then use the protocols, misuse the protocols. That's the way to do it. Because that allows you to use the network infrastructure, but for a different if you destroy network infrastructure, you can't achieve that. And then, you can that. This is an example of, so we have measurements. 
these measurements will never give us the exact information that we are looking for. It gives us some approximate. That doesn't mean it's bad. But if you have approximation information, then what you want to have is a model that is not, that cannot be demonstrated to be exactly wrong, but you want to have something that's really approximately right. That's all that you can ask for. But you certainly don't want to be in this corner of being verifiably wrong. And the scale of the models and this heuristic optimization based models are two examples of in the internet context where one is clearly wrong and the other one is a box. <coughs> if you want to read some of the stuff here, is uh, some of the papers that go with much of this talk. And if you want a, a, a short rant that complains about how we as networking people seem to be so allure to this natural science stuff, uh, I gave a short talk in Sitcom workshop a couple of months ago online. <laughs> but uh, that's all that I have to say. Sorry. No, it's, it's only for me. two sources of inaccuracy of uh, um, a trace route uh, uh, based route uh, discovery, um, uh, which is uh, uh, LSS and MPLS tunnel. Yeah. It seems to me that both of them can only sort of reduce the, 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 the degree of a node that you discover, because you know, LS sort of splits the node, yeah. and uh, similarly, MPLS route sort of hides the transit links. So how would you, how, how, how did the, uh, erroneously high degree nodes came about. Well, I mean, the MPLS one is a, is a beautiful example. So, if you have a network that has a thousand routers, thousand pops, let's say, a couple of hundred pops, uh, trace route comes to the ingress node, and it will, and, you did, and, and now you don't see it anymore using the network. And oh, you so from all the other. Uh, uh, yeah. In English route, yes. they will all converge to the same. Yes. Uh, yes. So that immediately gives you a high degree number. Okay. And, and, and most of them that appear in this data that have been used can actually be identified as MPMS nodes. And, and I should have said this it is really ironic that the first paper that did trace route based measurement explain all of this in detail. So this was a 1995 paper by the two French guys, uh, Penziot and Grad. And they said, we do these measurements, these trace route measurements for one purpose, and that is to get some idea about the shape of multicast trees in the network. And then they gave all a whole list of issues that come with that data. And then at the end they say, we did our best and we still use it for this purpose. It's a beautiful piece of paper that almost nobody reads. And it's the first paper. And it has been completely ignored ever since Taluzos took that data and said, oh, this is actually the outer level topology of the Where the paper explicitly says, no, it's multicast, shape of multicast space. So it's, it's, a, it's really important. Uh, we practice what you say. Oh, that's good. We do. And actually, the next speaker is the same. Yeah. We're going to do things Yeah. Can we? We don't like the connection we just made. We are then we're connecting network and principles to system design. The way you exactly describe. The question I have is this: to do this properly. We need models yeah. for the protocol, for the behavior, for the metrics, and all that stuff. Yeah. Some of these models uh, go into what we now call systems. 